just a few minutes for everybody to be able to sign in and then we'll begin. But I wanted you to know that we're here. But I wanted you to know that we're here. So welcome everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for the Garrison Institute's forum series on Pathways to Planetary Health. I am Jonathan Rose, the co-founder of the Garrison Institute, and it is my great pleasure to host this conversation with Gideon Rose. Gideon has been the editor of, I'm gonna disconnect, one second. My phone is ringing, I'm gonna disconnect it. I forgot to do that, and then we'll start all over again. Okay. I'm going to start all over again. Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for the Garrison Institute's forum series on Pathways to Planetary Health. I'm Jonathan Rose, the co-founder of the Garrison Institute, and it's my pleasure to host this conversation with Gideon Rose. Gideon has been the editor of Foreign Affairs magazine since 2010, after serving as managing editor of the magazine from 2000. Prior to that, he was the Deputy Director of Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations from 1994 and 95. He served as the Associate Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs on the staff of the National Security Council. He received his BA in Classics from Yale and a PhD in Government from Harvard and has taught on American foreign policy at Princeton and Columbia. And he is the author of How Wars End, by Simon and & Schuster and other works. Before we begin today's uh, conversation, a few logistical issues. We're in a Zoom webinar. Participant audio and video are off. We will reserve the last 15 minutes of this for your questions, so please post them in the Q&A panel. We're on for about an hour today and we'll respond to as many questions as we can and we reserve the right to not answer all the questions. The recording of this conversation will be made available on the Garrison Institute website. So let's get started. Gideon, I want, oh, and the other thing is Gideon is my cousin. You may have noticed the name similarity. Uh, we've had very different careers, but here we come together. So I wanna begin with this amazing book called um, How Wars End, which Gideon wrote about 10 years ago. And very briefly, what Gideon notes is that we have a um, whole structure for how we get into wars and a whole system for getting into wars, but we don't think a lot about how we get out of wars. And really, that war is just one of the many tools to achieve larger ends. And we've not been doing so well in the 20th century uh, in getting out in 21st century and getting out of war. So why don't we start there, Gideon, and then we're gonna go deeper into foreign policy and, and some other things. Thank you, it's great to be here. Um, so I started working on war endings when I wanted to do something big and I realized that war startings had already been done. The origins of wars was a hoary old topic in political science. And so uh, I figured as a good Clausewitzian, the same question should be raised at the end of the war when you stop using violence. For a Clausewitzian, war is defined by its means, not by the ends. The ends are political. All states want X and Y. And you, at some point you choose to use violent means to achieve those goals. And then at some point when the war ends, both parties stop using violent means. So it seemed to me those were symmetrical questions and, I, and no one really looked at the ends of wars. So I, it seemed theoretically fruitful. When I started doing the research, I realized that there was almost no historical attention to the subject either. And I had to create records of what happened at the ends of American wars, which was what I was studying. And the more I did that, a weird pattern emerged that I really resisted. We kept screwing up the ends of wars and we kept screwing them up in very predictable, stupid ways, like mm. not doing basic due diligence on what it, you wanted or not thinking through your goals or prioritizing co potentially competing goals until the last minute when you had to make a big choice and then therefore not planning for it. Or refusing to accept some obvious reality that everybody else around you could see coming and then you didn't see it. Like the, the Shiites and the, and the Sunnis hate each other. That kind of stuff. Or that once you, if you took out Saddam, you would have to have a solution to the domestic problems of Iraq. 
And if you didn't take out Saddam, you'd have to have a solution to the problems of Saddam. So like, there's no free lunch. You just go back to dealing at the end of a war with the world the way it was before, plus whatever changes have occurred. And failure to think through the policies and implement them wisely had caused lots and lots of problems in war after war. And the more I studied this, and I wrote this in the early 90s, uh, as the Gulf War was playing out, I wrote much. I came up with the idea before the Gulf War. The Gulf War showed a lot of the arguments that eventually became a chapter in the book. And then the Iraq War displayed all the same faults and the Afghanistan War uh, to perfection, even after it was out. And then continuing uh, the interventions since then, uh, like Libya, a, a prime example of how not to run something by never thinking about the end. Or even. So the basic message of the book is really basic common sense. If you are doing something as serious and significant as war, understand what you're doing, have a good reason for doing it, have a strategy that uses the links, the means you're using to the ends you want to achieve, have a realistic plan, and then figure out how you're going to transition at the end of the day for what comes next. It was almost a kind of checklist manifesto for war, the way a sort of basic Clausewitzian person, and in fact, the army, the military has something called a five paragraph order, which junior officers have to fill out for various actions. And it's a basic checklist. Do you have the resources? What's the situation? How are you gonna get from here to there? All the stuff you need. And it turns out what I realized was there is no checklist and no really disciplined procedure for the amateurs at the top of the pyramid who make the most important decisions about war and peace. Once you get into the situation room and once you get into the Oval Office, you're in a small group of individuals, all of whom are unique, all of whom, few of whom are professionally disciplined as national security policymakers. They're basically politicians by that point. Um, and very few of them know the details of the situation. And so what often happens is not necessarily what the staff would have wanted. If you let the, when I was in government as a real peon, you made it sound like I was impressive. I was not particularly impressive, but I got to see a fly on the wall and lots of things. And I came away with huge respect for the upper mid-level staff, the Sir Humphreys, if you wanted to, uh, the deep state types you're seeing in the impeachment trial, et cetera. Those became my heroes. And I came to think that the world would be run much better if we just listened to them and not the bosses, the deputies and the principal. By the way, Bob Gates's new book tells you what American foreign policy might have looked like because he was a deputy twice before he became a principal twice. And he still has that mentality in this new book. I reviewed it for the Times a little earlier in the summer. It's a very good example of that. But the reason this is kind of important was because I thought this was, I thought it couldn't be that simple. There had to be some powerful structural force making American policy screw up. I'm a political scientist. I'm a social scientist. I look for patterns. We screwed up war after war after war. Surely there was something causing that screw up it's bad social science to leap for an individual explanation for each case that leads the same outcome. But when I did the homework, when I did the research in the individual cases, I saw that it was indeed individuals screwing up. There was no, there were challenges in every war, but they could have dealt with the challenges better if they were rational and calm and sensible technocrats trying to achieve their very goals they had. And, history since I wrote the book, even in the United States of America, on the very area that I wrote it on, has proved that these mistakes get repeated and repeated right. again. And what we're seeing now, and what I've learned now in the last few years, is that was a general case, a specific case right. of a more general phenomenon, which is that things can go a lot better or a lot worse if the people making powerful decisions on important things, do their homework or not, are well motivated or not, are just basically professional or not. And that what you're seeing now with the pandemic response in the US is a kind of ultimate extreme case 
of uh, non-technocratic leadership. Right. And this is what it looks like because we're all paying attention. We can, or at least many of us are, we can see what's going on now because it all is very important and we're getting angry about it. Well, what also, we don't see yeah. is that, and what we normally assume, unless you're a total cynic, is that <coughs> it, it tends to be more like this than, what I'm now realizing is it's yeah. more like this than it should be in case after case after case. With and that is both depressing and annoying and inspiring and hopeful. It's depressing because it means we're not achieving what we can in area after area from war mm -hmm. to pandemics, to public health, to whatever. It is depressing and annoying. It's annoying because there are individual people who are screwing up and making us fall short of what we could and achieve. <clears throat> and it's hopeful because it suggests that the fault is not in the stars, but in ourselves, that it is not that solutions to problems aren't right. possible, but that we are failing to seize them individually and collectively. So this is a fantastic setup for what's gonna be the main subject of our day, which is if we take some of the deep principles that we study and teach at the Garrison Institute, and what if we said that we had leaders and systems that had several characteristics that we can combine and call social and emotional intelligence, and what would the resulting foreign policy be? But first I wanna take one perspective, and that is um, you know, one of the two great ideas, the many great ideas in Buddhism is, is that number one, everything is inter interdependent, that you have to look at things from a systems point of view and not from an individual action point of view. And everything has consequences and those unfold and unfold and unfold. And by the way, they pre-unfolded before you and unfold and fold. You're in this stream. And the more you have that longer view, but also that horizontal, it's not just the longer linear view, it's the horizontal side view that lets you see all the, mis the moving pieces, that'll inform you better. And the second one is this idea of impermanence, that everything is, there is no end state. See, the, interestingly, war almost, by the way, you know, war, we just need to put on the table so we don't have to say it six times, but war brings incredible suffering and a loss of human life and it means people and it destroys everything, memory and history and places and cities and, and there's a horrible, horrible tool to use. But war, so the, that's why I, I need to say that because the analogy I'm about to use, some people I think of war as like a baseball game. There's a bunch of innings and then it's over and then like either one or lost. But from this impermanent interdependent point of view, it's never, you know, like you kind of, even though it seems to have a start date, it really has a long you ooze into it and it never has an end date. No, I think you're absolutely correct in that, by the way. And the, 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 the standard analogy that people mistakenly use in the public mind for war is not even a baseball game. It's a, not, it's a boxing match. You hmm. beat the enemy and you knock him out. And the reason that is a bad analogy is because the boxing match ends when you knock out the other player. Yeah. But the war, the military phase of the war might end, but politics continues after. So you don't have to think what happens about the boxer after yeah. you've knocked him out, but you do have to think about that. So the game continues, there are other games and you're in an right. endless stream of things, yes. So what happens if we, to a foreign policy, uh, so this, this actually, I want to step back before we even talk about foreign policy, because foreign policy just sounds like an abstract idea on papers and, and, you know, there's this policy and that policy, but really behind that is a purpose. And the question is, can one successfully lead a, an important nation with a, with a magnanimous purpose, with a purpose that says that the reason for this policy is to both protect and make our citizens improve their well being, but actually to simultaneously improve the well being of the world. Absolutely. And the answer to your question is yes, they're all linked. And we've done it. And all we have to do is understand what we did, recapture uh, uh, our best selves, and live fully in a 21st century fashion, the American dream that 
we have been pursuing as a community for several hundred years. I will get to that in just a second, but let me sort of go with the, what you said, foreign policy is part of human relations more generally. And it has its own grammar. It's as Klaus has been said about military affairs, but not its own logic. It is similar to the patterns that play out in domestic politics and the patterns that pay out even in human interaction, social interaction. It's units cooperating or competing, playing with each other in some kind of social way, interacting. The basic historical trend, Yuval Hariri has done some good work on this and it's kind of funny, is towards the evolution of cooperation as Robert Axelrod no. put it in a famous game theoretic book. Uh, the logic of non-zero, as Robert Wright has put it. Right. We all start out as individual little creatures, and we have learned over the millennia uh, and centuries and decades to aggregate and pool our resources and play games and work with each other and achieve some collective goals. That's very, very hard. Cooperation is very difficult, especially with other people or other units. And what we see in international relations and foreign policy, I would argue, is not all that different from what we see in regular human interactions in an unregulated state of nature. That was the basic insight of theorists like Hobbes and Locke, who basically said, nations in the international sphere are kind of understood hypothetically or theoretically best understood like people in a hypothetical state of nature and Hobbes felt and, and that they will naturally basically kill each other and 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 are they're trying to survive in an anarchic world for Hobbes that yeah. meant that it was impossible to do that unless there was order that was maintained by a giant single sovereign so for Hobbes, he ended up with a world government under a Leviathan as the solution to all things, because that was the only way to stop war and peace. Locke said the state of nature and nations in there, it's not always war. Sometimes they want to cooperate. Sometimes they're getting, so we can be, we, we can have groups of individuals cooperating and forming communities that do better and do move forward. The United States itself as a country was a conscious effort to apply Lockean principles to a group of people saying, hey, we're going to found a political community to further our collective interests and protect those interests from outsiders in a way that doesn't diminish our individual goals, identity or choices, or, but nor entirely subsume them, but cooperates to create an entity larger than ourselves that allows us to pursue our individual goals as well as collective goals. That was what the founding was all about. The gradually over time, and by the way, that itself was a follow on for almost a century of cooperative effort in a kind of Puritan, Puritan way, like a Benjamin Franklin uh, secularized dissenting Protestantism, which did things like the lending library or a volunteer fire department or what became the University of, uh, uh, of Pennsylvania in which the notion was you could do things that were good for you, but also good for the public and that cooperation was possible, not necessary, not always inevitable, but potentially possible. What we've discovered over the last century, this last century, as the United States was powerful enough to become a really major actor in world affairs, is that those same kind of problems of cooperation exist on the international level. And after half a century, we basically, the first half of the 20th century, the Roosevelt administration said, okay, and the Truman administration, enough is enough. If we play the international game the old way, we're just going to keep repeating the cycle of 
violence and beggar thy neighbor economic policies and problematic uh, outcomes. Right. And we just can't do that anymore. And we're now powerful. So Roosevelt and Truman put in place a kind of revised Wilsonianism, which really is best understood as a kind of light model of the American domestic compact writ large internationally. We're going to play as a team. We're gonna take our allies, and in fact, anybody who's willing to join with us and join our team, as long as you play by the rules, you get to play on our team. And we're gonna create a system that works for us, but also for you guys and achieves buy-in. And in that way, we'll try to reduce the anarchy of the Hobbesian world and create a sort of little Lockean area. We started to do that. And for 75 years, we've been actually kind of doing that. And increasingly now the world is indeed in practice run by a consortium of good guys led by the United States that have provided a certain modicum of order and direction to geopolitical and economic affairs such that you have what is now the longest period of great power peace in history, decades of economic and technological development and progress that have lifted billions of people out of poverty and dramatic positive effects on human well-being and outcomes. But there are all sorts of problems sustaining that. What has happened in the last few years is the project has been forgotten, lost its moorings, the downsides have uh, been overlooked, seized on by demagogues. And what I just described sounds now like some kind of weird 90s utopianism uh, that uh, where has he been for the last couple of decades? But it's just a fraying around the edges and the answer to the current dilemma that we're finding ourselves in is not to say it was all silly and wrong, not to give in to despair, not to abandon it in some new utopian effort for something that's even more unrealizable, but rather to redouble our efforts to figure out how to implement that same basic vision and do for the 21st century what the United States managed to do for the 20th century. If you compare the first half of the 20th century right. to the second half. So there's, a, so there's a couple of challenges I want to put on the table. So the first is, by the way, um, uh, the neurobiologist, the sociobiologist E.O. Wilson <clears throat> has written many books on this, but one he calls The Social Conquest of the Earth, in which he says that humanity's rise as a species is because of our ability to collaborate. Interestingly, actually, um, Neanderthals had bigger brains than we did. And there is a, an actual kind of associative uh, intelligence. We, we know that in mammals, the bigger the brain, the more intelligence they seem to have. So if the Neanderthals were more intelligent than us, why did we end up killing them? And the answer, uh, although we made love along the way because we have 3% Neanderthal genes in us. So, and the answer is that um, be, the belief is that it was our social intelligence, our ability to network our brains so we could have smaller brains, but then network together at a bigger power. And um, uh, E.O. Wilson describes how this social power is, uh, has um, uh, incredible, you know, it, it's really leveraging the intelligence of a system. There's also a lot of work on the uh, in, inherent mutuality, et cetera, uh, within our evolutionary propensity. So with these, you talk about Locke's, you know, Locke and Hobbes, there are these kind of two trends and one of them, so uh, Nicholas Christakis just wrote a book called Blueprint, uh, which he calls the evolutionary origins of a good society. So he's saying it is in our nature to be good. Now to go back to E.O. Wilson, he says, aha, but this social, um, social ability has a limit. And the limit is the limit of the tribe. So we are very wired, and we now know this from neuroscience, that actually the more, um, the deeper your in-group affection. So if you're totally in love with your people, you tend to be more hateful of the other people. There's actually this love Im improperly attributed, does not generate more love, it creates a counter reaction. So that's all a long prelude to the question I'm gonna ask you, which is, 
We are now faced with the issue of climate change. I'm going to raise two issues with you. One is climate change, and one is an economy which is, has become so unequal that it's going to become a destructive economic force. If you look at the rise of everything you described in the 20th century or the great successes, one of the reasons was they were not only political and democratic successes and they lifted people's well being and prosperity, they were amazing corporate successes. They did the business community and the finance community did incredibly well. Now, when you have climate change, you have a whole sector of the business community known as the fossil fuel industry which knows that the answer to save the world and to increase human prosperity is exactly against what it views as its current interests. So the question is, is so was that a learning? So in effect, it was that we got everybody, enough people feeling they're part of the same tribe. Once people feel like they're parts of different tribes, the system doesn't work. So how do we create enough of the same tribe, including business interests to help solve the issue of climate change? Okay, great questions. Uh, first of all, I would just say that it's not limited to climate change uh, or socioeconomic inequality. I mean, what you just described uh, is the story of partisan polarization mm -hmm. in the US that will be true even after the election and mm -hmm. therefore some sort of any attempt to repair and heal the country and move forward as a unified American polity post November, if there is a, you know, whatever happens post November, yeah. uh, will involve that same process that you just described. Uh, so it's not just about how do we do it in order to attack climate change, it's how even do we manage to live together. So what I'd say is the following. The just so stories about evolutionary stuff are, are fun to read. No, no, I love them too, and they're fun. I, I mentioned Hariri, and everybody should read Sapiens and so forth. But you know, obviously, it's, it's all a bit sort of you know, uh, just that just so stories. The but but it's you can see it in our own lives on a daily basis. Look, the science that you're describing about contemporary uh, neuroscience and cognitive science and uh, other kinds of science uh, is well summed up in a wonderful article uh, we ran a couple of years ago by uh, Robert Sapolsky, yep, uh, he, he wrote the biology book. of nationalism, like biology of us and them, right? And it's basically the, the the basic summary is what you said, which is we are hardwired to lean towards an us versus them in group out group. Uh, uh, mental way of thinking. We are very quick to have fight or flight responses in which can trigger those lines. And those things tend to be very small relative groups based on things like kinship and clan and you know, evolution like that. And that that is hardwired into our brains and our, at, a, at a subconscious gut physical level that, that we don't even know about. And that therefore we're prone to be susceptible to appeals to those bad groups or nature or positive, whatever. Okay. That is the tendency. However, it is not destiny. Right. Uh, Victor Frankl's thinking, as summarized by uh, Covey, about basically that there's a pause between stimulus and response. And in that pause lies the possibility for choice. And in that possibility for choice, I'm paraphrasing here, lies the possibility of human action and human dignity and humanity. We have that choice. We're not monkeys. We are primates, but we're not baboons. We're not bonobos. We're not gonna go around you know, in some hippie community all fun, but nor are we necessarily pure baboons either. We are humans. And what we have seen and what we see every day, all of us see every day, is the full potential of outcomes that we have choice over individually and collectively. Nothing is written. There are tendencies, but in the short run, nothing is written. I happen to like to gamble. 
in the long run, anybody who goes to a casino is an idiot because in the long run, you'll lose because the house odds are with you. In the short run, it's near random. And anybody can do very well or very poorly in the short run, and it can be a lot of fun. But the same thing is kind of true of the human tendencies. Whatever the long run tendencies are, and you can paint those brand historical narratives towards positive or negative or whatever, it, the jury is always still out. Uh, as a friend of mine put it, when I tried to make the case about humanity being much better off during the 20th century because of all the material progress, he said, yes, the ovens were filled with much taller, fatter, larger people than they would have been in previous years. You know, that, okay, that you can paint history at the grand scale as you wish, the narrative. In the short run, anything is possible and it's what we created. And that's the real lesson of the last few years even the last year, which is anything is possible, nothing is written, and what matters is not what happens to you, but how you deal with it, individually and as a community. And the way that to move past all the bad stuff and the way to reinvigorate that project that I talked about, is to basically take a kind of Rooseveltian view. FDR in his fourth inaugural had a wonderful sort of perspective. Just before he was dying, he knew he was dying and he knew that he was like Moses, he could see the promised land, but he couldn't cross over. And so he was giving his last will and testament uh, on what you should do. And he said, we've learned that we can't live like dogs in a manger. We've learned that we can't live like savages. We've learned to have cooperation. He believed it. He meant it. And the Roosevelt administration demonstrated it. They were the world's most dominant player ever. We bestrode the world like a colossus. And what Roosevelt, in his ur Americanness, as a Benjamin Franklin ultimate clone understood was that American freedom and prosperity and security were best fulfilled in an ever expanding world in which ever more people would have the potential and more countries, the potential to achieve their prosperity and freedom and security. That these were positive collective goods, right. that our security didn't come at the, ex that because we were just wanted to do really well and didn't want to get, we came over here to get away from all that crap and we wanted to do well. And so to create a world in which everybody could sort of do that and play nicely with each other, that was the price of coming in. The problem is we are now less powerful than we were back then but we're, fe we're not feeling as secure. And precisely in, I think in some ways as, just like white Americans as they approach a uh, majority minority country, start to get their racial reflexes triggered when you mention that to them. Uh, fears of the rise of the rest and American relative decline and the fruition of the very thing we wanted, a world filled with other powerful, interesting developed places. As we start to see that, it scares us. And instead of being more generous and realizing that there is room on the couch for all and scooting over right. a little bit, we, we try to clamp down. And so the answer is to rediscover our better angels and to mm -hmm. do so with precisely the help of the Garrison Institute type mindfulness that is and can be a kind of secularized version of the basic American creed that suggests that individual and collective interests can be harmonized rather than dominant one or the other involved. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, Rebecca Solnit wrote a really interesting book called A Paradise Built in Hell. And what she observed is that whenever there's a disaster, so we're talking about the pre-wiring and you know our wiring progression and all that. But it seems universal that we then are wired for mutuality. 
So for example, if you, those who were in New York during 9-11, everybody was in love, you know, love on the street, helping anybody they could. And, and she starts her book in the uh, great earthquake in San Francisco in uh, 1906 when, and then the fire as it came or 1907, that, that then um, instantly people set up uh, camps for people to stay in, in the middle of the city. And they, they and people all took all the food they had and cooked it for everybody else. And, and then over and over again, we see that when disaster comes, uh, mutuality is also wired within us. So in part, the goal is how do we get the mutuality without having the disaster? <laughs> well, or I, I think that, that, that I, that's definitely a way to put it, but it would also be both of those potentials are in us. Yeah, the potential right. to cause the harm, the potential to repair, the potential to be a jerk. The, uh, Christ, every one of us every day yeah, cycles through roles of a whole range of things. The only, I mean, none of us is perfect or saintly, uh, and, and we're jerks too. The only question is sort of the relative proportion of this right. in one's behavior, okay? So the question then becomes exactly as you said, okay, fine, we know it's possible for bad things to happen, we know yeah. it's possible for good things to happen. How do you make the good things happen, schmuck? Okay, the answer is you have a process and you have a structural framework that is theoretically well-grounded, empirically sound, and logically consistent. And it right. just so happens that for individual happiness and well-being, social happiness and well-being, international and global happiness and well-being, there is indeed a kind of good pathway towards right. that. And, you know, the, the, the good folks at Google, uh, in, among their, all their various potential nefarious activities, uh, also came up, people may or may not know, uh, with a wonderful uh, summary of what you might call the mindfulness approach uh, to life in their Search Inside Yourself program. I know the Garrison Institute actually has some of those uh, seminars there, you can see there. Yeah. And they sort of boil it down to a, a series of uh, uh, actionable steps that I really like. The first part is self-awareness. Until you stop and be aware, you're, you're not even beginning the process. After self-awareness comes, ideally, self-management. You get yourself in control and then you can actually figure out where you are and do something. Then comes motivation, aligning yourself with some conscious, sensible purpose, whatever pro-social thing you happen to you know, go for, whatever it works, works for you. Then comes empathy, which is understanding that you're in a world with others and those others are not you. And that you're more likely to be able to cooperate with them if you understand them and if you understand what they need to do. And from a position of empathy, you can then move towards compassion, which is not just understanding them, but even having some modicum of fellow feeling or collective participation in some border project. And that from that participation, that point, it allows you to lead them and you to find some mutual solution to your problem, some way forward that is mutually valid, that achieves something you want and they want in a better way. It sounds so easy and it is, as long as we can deal with all those stupid mm -hmm. damn human emotions that get in the way of being the kind of beatific creatures who lead the Garrison Institute retreats. We've all met these people. I imagine people on this call have met these people who walk around like the Dalai Lama's you know, children with little implicit halos around their head, building out beaming serenity around the world. If we were like that, we wouldn't like that. We're not like that. And if you're a complete opposite of that, you're not gonna have, the, the, then you're stuck in Hobbes world. The challenge for all of us is, okay, how do we at least even understand those steps and how do we 
remind ourselves and remind each other and help each other individually and collectively along that journey so that we can figure out ways of relating to each other that release the potential gains from cooperation that exist. Nobody is suggesting, nobody with their right mind, that it's easy or unproblematic. It's just that there are some obvious, no, to go back to what I said in the very beginning about the wars. What I found to my shock and horror when I studied wars very granularly, was that there were a hell of a lot of unforced errors at mm -hmm. the highest levels that caused dramatic human consequences. It shouldn't have been that way, logically, because the pressures of the situation should have selected for the most rigorous, serious thought because it was that important. But it didn't work that way. People acted stupidly and lots of other people died as a result. You think the market, to say what you were saying, economic logic says, oh, the market's efficient. It is what it is. It can't be all that different. No, you know what? It can. If you look at the actual companies, they're not the rational calculating paragons of neoliberal theory. They're cesspools of human activity like every other place filled with individuals, many of whom are jockeying for internal power and position, making decisions based on all sorts of personal stuff. And the rationality of the market comes from long-term selection effects, not from the notion that every individual right. player is doing rational things. What this means is the world around us is filled with unrealized gains. There are indeed lots of dollar bills, $20 bills, $100 bills lying around but they're only visible to people who can see how they can be realized. And it's difficult to get people together to realize them. And that's the challenge. The specific way to do that, let me just say one thing about policy, because you were talking about policies and I just want to, the, the, the Google people boiled down their advice mm -hmm. to how you should react to a situation. If you want to be a good mindful person and you want to do the right thing, you want to follow the guidelines and get a garrison institute, get, you know, house, good housekeeping seal of approval for your mental health and behavior and wellness. You will follow these guidelines. It's when everything, anything happens, when any kind of trigger happens, when any kind of stimulus happens, you stop, breathe, notice, reflect and respond. The idea is- You that, act soberly. What? You act well, that, soberly. So basically the idea is that humans normally are prey to these cognitive triggers that basically make us act like baboons. Right. And that if you unthinkingly act, you are acting with your unconscious mind and you right. are basically wrong, right? And they should do that too. Think of 9-11. 9-11, we were struck violently, out of the blue, terrorized. What did the United States do? We acted as if we were a creature who was hurt. And we immediately lashed out in a violent reflection, rebounding it, torturing and killing, just like we were tortured and killed. Passionately angry, just like we were the subjects of passionate anger falling prey to outgroup homogeneity bias in the same way that we were the victims of outgroup homogeneity bias. All because we didn't stop, breathe, notice, reflect, and respond. Think of how the world would look today if on the morning of, the late morning of 9-11, the occupants of the White House and the plane flying around mm -hmm. could have gotten a good facilitator and said, okay, stop. We're all very upset right now. First thing, everybody take deep breaths, okay? Everybody chill, no anger, no phone, get off the mm -hmm. news, stop. Everybody breathe, calm yourself, center, okay. What's happening right now? 
What's actually happening and what are we feeling? Okay, put aside the feelings. Let's look at the facts. Okay, given this, what do we really need to do now? How should we react? What is the best way of moving forward at this moment that will produce the lowest possible negative consequences as well as the highest possible consequences, the best net result? Okay, can we have we thought that through? Okay, only now let's do that and let's check in again to keep us going. Okay. If we as a metaphorically as a nation had done that, we would have reacted a lot differently in Afghanistan, eventually. We would have acted a lot differently in Iraq. Mm -hmm. We would have acted a lot differently in the war on terror more generally. We would have not fallen into the trap that Osama bin Laden set for us, which was to provoke us into an overreaction right. in order to create tensions inside the Muslim world. He got his own ox gourd, but that was, you know, along the way he got what he wanted, which was a heightening of contrast uh, uh, of tension. Right. But, um, and we would have had a, a, an approach to the war on terror that would have tried to separate the people doing it from their broader populations rather than driving their populations into the arms of the terrorists by displaying all the things that the terrorists said were true about us, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that kind of stuff. And if you say, oh, it's ridiculous to think government could do that. Well, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy, uh, not the saint, his his advocates say, yeah. but 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 a reasonable guy in certain respects who had just read Barbara Tuckman's Guns of August, right. uh, got everybody together in a group called XCOM and uh, the executive committee and rationally debated right. how they should respond to the Cuban Missile right. Crisis. And, and we got through, okay. Uh, and so uh, Eisenhower, when trying to deal with the early Cold War, set up a project called Solarium in which he basically had three different teams of top right. serious technocrats rationally debate what, you know, uh, different strategies so that the government could think it through. It can be done. We've just gotten out of the right. habit of doing it individually and collectively. And then the challenge becomes getting ourselves individually and collectively to be the better people we know we can be. But the good news is the answers are there and it is possible. Great. We have some questions, but I just want to note for the audience a couple of things. Um, uh, Search Inside Yourself is holding a retreat at the Garrison Institute, and we have now figured out how to have incredibly safe on-site retreats. So take a look in the chat box for that, number one. And number two, what Gideon described is a process called sober. So remember the phrase sober. So stop is S and observe is O and uh, uh, B is breathe. I'm sorry, SO is stop and B is breathe and R is reflect. I can't remember what the E is. And the final R is respond. Um, and, it, uh, and to go back to an earlier thing Gideon said, uh, which is um, the quote, uh, Victor Frankl's quote about between the stimulus and the response, this is exactly it is. If we can create pauses, contemplative pauses between our stimuluses and our responses and actually think things through, we can take ourselves out of the bad Sapolsky description of us and into the good Christakis description of us. Um, so some questions. So I'm gonna name the people because I have a feeling you know them. Do you know Georgia Pangea Topolu? Uh, she says that Heraclitus, a pre-Socratic uh, philosopher, who, by the way, is the person who observed that everything is in continuous flow, said, war is the father of all things. So what do you think is the mother of all things? And how might that lead to peace, she also asks. So, you know, uh, uh, Mother Demeter, uh, uh, would say that, uh, you know, the planet, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you could, it's an interesting point. You could say, you know, Aries and, and, uh, Demeter or something like that. You could, you know, war and, and, uh, ecology or, or cooperative, uh, progress, the sort of war is zero sum and, uh, uh, the opposite, uh, uh, it would be positive sum. Not the opposite of war is not you know a lack of war. It's a it's a cooperative piece, uh, not just an absence of war. Um, you know, on the gender thing, it's actually interesting. I've 
the good liberal in me resists any kind of group ascriptive attributes other than the human level mm -hmm. uh, and thinks a lot of it. But but there but still it, there are clearly something is true. And I have now at, at late in the day I am more apt to think that a high level leadership group that is substantially or at least uh, plurality or majority women uh, will be more rational and less prone to the cognitive biases right. that we're talking about. Not necessarily, I think the ideal decision-making group would be maybe slight, you know, 60, 40 women, men or something like that. Uh, enough to keep the uh, 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 you know, discussion rational while still having a nice bit of contention in there. Um, and somebody else asked, Bob Schloss asked, how do we get uh, cabinet level officials who are more systems thinker. Now, the problem is, of course, that they're often appointed for political reasons, so. A fish rots from the head. Uh, uh, cabinet officials are reflections of the president. The president, you know, everything flows down. Everything is chosen and it, it's, it, one of the most appalling and depressing things to watch as I've gotten older, has been the, I was a young technocrat inside and I fell uh, hard for the deep state uh, uh, technocrats inside who slave away for very little pay, very little prestige or recognition, very rarely getting anything much, uh, but just because they're trying to make things a little better, good public servants. Uh, I know the national security one's best across various fields, but they're also true throughout domestic policy areas. And I apprenticed at the feet of those men and women and learned the trade. Mm -hmm. And now I run foreign affairs as sort of like a house journal for the good technocrats and right. sensible people doing public policy to sort of say what should be done on right. various issues, even though it never gets done. And one of the sad, depressing things is to see that whole community be not just laughed at, mocked, hounded out, but to be to see the wisdom lost uh, and to realize that when those people go, much of their wisdom will go with them. And that far from there being an ongoing pool of knowledge and wisdom that is added to, uh, we're actually losing the collective wisdom that we've already had and built up over generations in various fields of life and public service. And so my favorite project that I'm working on at the magazine now is not just the ongoing coverage of things mm. in the magazine, but a, an interview project called How I Got Here, which is trying to sort of download before they go oh, many fantastic. of the good top people in terms of their attitudes and their careers, like a pensive in Harry Potter. Yeah. So like, tell me all the great things that you would tell future generations so that we can do it. And it's up there on the Foreign Affairs Career Center website. Um, but it's really cool and it's using a lot of technocrats. So for example, the one after this, I'm going back to do one with, to finish off editing Michelle Flournoy's. Um, now Michelle might very well be a cabinet member in the next administration. It would be, if you had a bet, you'd say she was you know, likely to be a, a, a defense department candidate for a defense secretary. And to see sort of, you know, the history and career and, uh, of someone like that and the attitude. All I'll say is to the answer to the specific question, how do you get uh, cabinet members who do the right thing? The answer is you pick people who you know will do the right thing. And the question is just getting good people or getting decency and mm. right intention as well as intelligence and political loyalty valorized as something we want in our top public mm. service. Right. And that takes us back to something you referred to in the beginning, which the Dalai Lama calls secular ethics. That in the past, we thought we ethics were theoretically held by the world's religious traditions. They, they, they were the carrier. You've described how it's important to have a cultural carrier that carries wisdom forward from generation to generation and actually keeps refining it and improving it. And religions played that role. The religions have also not played that role. But right now, it seems like there's a need for a secular ethics. There is, but I think that, you know, this era is actually very clarifying, even in its depressingness, because mm -hmm. of its depressingness, in the sense that, I don't know about everybody else, but 
along with the chaos and the despair, um, it all seems very clear, which is mm -hmm. all the people trying to, there's a CEO, by the way, the Google people do something which some of the mindful types don't like, which is they try to connect it all to, you know, big tech business leadership as no. well, right? And so the, they're tech CEOs who are often held up as the enlightened team. But no. one of them guys, he just stepped down as the head of, I forget, uh, LinkedIn, I think it was, or no, not LinkedIn, but Jeff, what's his name? Anyway, but it, it, there's a, it, it, he's held up as an example of how to use mindfulness in practice when someone's screaming at you and shouting at you and having a, uh, a, a, a difficult conversation, right? He says, look, I, I hear what you're saying. I understand you're upset, but I'm here to try to make things better, to try to solve it. Are you interested in trying to make things better? What mm. is, how do we go forward from here? Right. Are you trying to be part of a constructive solution? And I guess for me, it's really simple, which is right now, it's very clear. There are lots and lots of people who are just simply not interested in being part of a constructive solution. Right. They are prey to their emotions. They are trapped in their in-group, out-group identities. They are trapped in their anger. They're so hurt themselves for one reason or another that they can't find something to go beyond it or they're just not good people at all whatever i don't know and i don't care they're beyond cooperation but there are a lot of others who are interested and it's not affiliated with any particular group or any particular doctrine or person or political view or religion it's just decent people who right want to make the world somewhat better for themselves and other people and recognize that those things aren't contradictory. Mm -hmm. Anybody who will subscribe to that credo is part of the good guy team. And the only thing that those people need to do is figure out how to connect with each other, put in place systems and institutions and processes to facilitate and enable cooperation at various levels and somehow keep putting one foot forward and taking solace from each other so they don't despair. I would just go listen to Barack Obama's speech the other night again and again and again, and just basically say, okay, this is all happening, but just mm -hmm. keep moving forward. That is a fantastic way to close. And I would say, if you want to see what the good guy team is doing and thinking, subscribe <laughs> to Foreign Affairs. It is the global, American-centered, but global magazine that collects the good guys in foreign policy and gives them a voice to speak and a place to listen. Go ahead. I just want to, I guess I would close, I closed my introduction to the current issue. Um, interestingly, quoting Samuel Huntington and Jesse Jackson, which I did not ever think I would do in the same kind of thing. But uh, uh, Huntington said at one point, wrote one point that America is not a lie, it's a disappointment. But it's a disappointment only because it is a hope. And that's a really deep truism. He wrote that half a century ago, and it's still true now, and it's always been true. And the challenge now for all of us is to keep that hope alive. Right. Perfect. That is our challenge. Thank you, Gideon, for joining us today. And thank you, all of you. Uh, these sessions are offered for free, but we would love it if you would consider making a donation, each one of you uh, who's listening. Uh, it supports our programming and the continuation of this. Please keep checking the garrisoninstitute.org for updated listings of future sessions and also recordings of this uh, and others in the past. Our next conversation on Pathways to Planetary Health Forum is on Thursday, September 10th at 2 p.m., with the Hopi independent filmmaker, Victor Vasayesva, who's gonna talk about these issues again, but from the Hopi worldview. Uh, so join us. From hope to Hopi. From, exactly, from hope to Hopi. Uh, thank you.